just finishing a series uh, in Exodus called Finding Authentic Freedom. So as Pastor Bob and I were praying about the ends uh, of these messages here, we really felt like instead of just ending at Easter Sunday, what if we tied that Exodus theme into the post-resurrection journey? Because here's the reality. When you study the Gospels, a lot of what is written there echo the Exodus story for Israel. Really, that was the main premise of what they have. We have Jesus' crucifixion taking place at Passover. This is a significant journey. And we find in Luke chapter 9 that as he's there with Elijah and Moses and the disciples don't know what to do, literally it says they're talking about his departure. That's the word Exodus in Greek. They're talking about his Exodus he's about to make because we know that God didn't just set us free from literal captivity, but spiritual captivity for a life as new creations in Christ. That there's a Exodus journey he has us all in. So today, we're going to look at a familiar story. We're going to go back into the resurrection story and follow those post stories. So this week, I'll cover a portion in Luke, and then Bob will cover a portion in John. So do me a favor, turn your Bibles to Luke chapter 24. Let's go there, Luke chapter 24. We're going to start with the end and go back to the beginning. So Luke 24. Verse 30 and 31. So Luke 24, 30 and 31. And then at the end of my message, my good friend Tyler Frederick, give it up for Tyler, come on, is going to share his story. Now, I do want to give a preference here. Uh, we really believe in sharing authentic, real testimonies. We know that your stories are not neat, clean, and tiny, and sanitized. We know that everybody has uh, backgrounds that are real, and we believe in sharing the real stuff in our life. We know it says in Revelation, we overcome by the blood of the Lamb and the word of our testimony. That's how conquerors are made. So we know that we want us to be set free from those areas of bondage and captivity, things that we hide uh, in our back closets we don't want people to see. So as we get healed and God sets us free, we believe in sharing those authentic testimonies. So today's uh, message will have some very mature themes within them. So if you have a, a, a young one here that you're not quite sure if it's the right time for them to hear certain things, we believe that the world is educating most of our young ones in ways of perversion uh, that many in the the church are not talking about. So we really believe we want to get on the front end of that discussion and not have the world leading us in how we decide how our sexuality is really formed. So uh, we will share things openly and honestly. Being a youth pastor for 12 years, uh, we talked about things that most people felt uncomfortable talking about in church. But guess what? We believe that God wants to shine light where there's darkness. So uh, today will be in challenging and encouraging testimony. Last time was the first time he's ever shared it. So uh, get ready to get some Kleenex nearby you. Let's just say that. So Luke 24, 30 and 31, we'll read this and then we'll pray. It says this, this is Jesus. When he was at the table with them, he took bread, blessed it and broke it and gave it to them. And then their eyes were opened and they recognized him and he vanished from their sight. Holy Spirit, we just thank you for your presence that's here. We thank you for your presence that was in worship. And just in that worship time, just praying for a few people here. I got a couple senses, a couple pictures for some people here. I really feel like there are those here that have really been overwhelmed by anxiety. You've been dealing with panic or anxiety attacks recently. Just with eyes closed, if that's you, just raise your hand right now. You've been dealing in a tough season of anxiety and panic attacks. Father, we just declare right now, anxiety has to leave in Jesus' name. That you would come and bring perfect peace, that you would unite those with trust in this season of worry. That you have cast it all, we cast all cares upon you, for you care for us. And God, we just pray that you would calm the storm in their season of life right now. Jesus, we thank you that you're on the boat with them. Even though it may feel like you're asleep, you're ever present with them. We just pray that in this journey of trust, they would not be overwhelmed. And uh, a little slightly different word, I felt like there was some here that had a recent bout with claustrophobia, where you were in a place that would felt small, uh, or you were in a crowd of some time, and you had a, a, an attack of some kind based off of claustrophobia. If that's you, just go ahead and lift your hand. Father, right now, we just pray there'd be no fear in dark or small places in Jesus' name. Even when they go to sleep at night, they would not feel like the room is closing in upon them. We just bind the spirit of darkness and fear in Jesus' name, and we just declare freedom and hope and encouragement for them to not feel bound by darkness where they may have been taken advantage of in those places. Father, we thank you that you can come and bring healing. And lastly, I feel like there's some gastrointestinal issues. If you have an issue uh, in your stomach area or in your intestines, just go ahead and lift your hand up if that's you. Father, we just pray for healing for diverticulitis right now. 
Lord, we pray for any specific areas of digestion, Lord, where there's been severe heartburn or acid reflux. God, we just pray for healing in a supernatural way. In Jesus' name, amen. Turn to the person next to you say, get ready. Get ready. We're going to wake up. I promise you, 9 a.m., you will be alive and awake by the time you leave today. Uh, just recently, about a month and a half ago, my wife was in a car accident, uh, and she's okay by God's grace. But here's a picture of what the car looked like in the, uh, uh, the demo center as they were about to take it down. So uh, my wife was traveling to a conference in Sacramento, and as she's there, I get this phone call. My wife calls says, babe, I was in an accident. And like a good husband, I said first, is the car okay? No, I'm just kidding. I said, are you okay? And so I, so I passed the test. It was good. I said, are you okay? She said, yeah, I'm okay. I'm fine. But the car is not okay, as you can see here. So sure enough, she's driving down the freeway, and she's worshiping Jesus, paying attention by God's grace. And yet someone comes in and hits her in her lane. And now the way the cars looked, it really wasn't one of those cases where there was any witnesses. So kind of each one's denying fault in that case. So now we enter this insurance battle. So they place us in a rental car. We're trying to get things sorted out. And it's in those moments when you have a car accident, you know how good or not good your insurance company is. We fell in the not good category. So as we're there, people are dropping the ball. And I have luckily an agent that, that finds me deals. And uh, I, I was just calling him and saying, hey, you have to get after these people. And I'm realizing as I'm on the phone, I'm a Christian. And every time I talk to somebody, I'm a witness. But there are moments I, I wanted to lose my witness. Let's just put it that way. So I'm talking, and then I would call my agent, Bill, and Bill's not a believer, so we'd have those non-believer conversations with them with a lot of passion and anger, so Bill was my representative in that moment, so as we're trying to sort things out with the insurance company, a week goes by, two weeks go by, 40 days go by, we're in this rental car, and they are confused and paperwork's being dropped so finally they tell us that our car is totaled and now we have to go to the collision center to collect anything left in the car before they total it so I'm there and I'd been on the the phone with the insurance company that morning and I'm frustrated and I'm angry I'm with my wife I'm with my youngest son Kingston as the other kids are in school and as I'm walking there uh, this giant man comes out to take us to our, our car and I don't know what it is if you have to work at a car lot you're like these giant lumberjacks that come from the forest so this man literally looks like a carry redwood trees on his back so probably six foot four six foot five just gigantic man he says come let me show you my car and you know you're kind of scared as he's walking you to his car so as we're there we're we're trying to have conversation but again i'm grumpy and he starts opening up about his life i'm like oh no this is one of those moments i'm not in the mood for so as we're there talking i start to get this impression that he has severe back pain on his on his lower right side and i'm not i'm not in the mood for this and as we're talking, he's talking about music and bands. I'm like, this is not normal. So as we're walking back to the car, I feel like I'm supposed to pray for him. And we're just like, what's wrong? I'm like, I feel like I'm supposed to pray for this guy, but I'm not in the mood. She says, babe, you better pray for him. I'm like, I'm not. Because again, you go through all these stories of he's a car mechanic. He's not going to want to talk about this. He's going to. So as we're, we're there, I strap my son in the car. And he says, hey, let's go back and finish out the paperwork. So I'm there, and, I, and I'm walking with him, and I chicken out. I do the, um, hey, I'm a Christian. Anything I could pray for you for? And that's not what I'm supposed to ask. And he says, nope, everything's good. I got a new girlfriend. I just moved into a new place, got this new job. I'm totally fine. I know that wasn't what I was supposed to ask. So I said, okay, here's the deal. I'm a Christian. I believe God speaks. Do you have pain in your lower right side of your back? Is it severe pain? He says, holy blank, how did you know that? And I'm like, there it is. So, hey, I said, I believe Jesus speaks today, and I, I want to just pray for you for healing. He's like, how are you going to do that? I said, just, let's just grab hands real quick. And again, you're in this auto lot. It doesn't look right for a giant man to be grabbing this other man's hand in this auto lot. But I grab his hand and just real simple prayer. I said, Jesus, we just pray right now. You come and heal his back. Take all pain on the right side where there's been sciatic pain. I, he opens his eyes. I said, check it out. He says, oh, my goodness. How did you do that? I said, how much pain were you in? He said, I was at a nine. I said, what is it now? It's a four. So I said, let's pray one more time. We pray again, all pain leaves. And you see him. The presence of God shows up in this auto lot. And as we're there praying, 
I was able to give the word that God loves him and cares for him and God's visiting him in his life. I don't know what his past church issues were, but God's showing up to show genuine love and care in his moment of pain, in his moment of difficulty. Then his boss walks in. What are you doing holding hands with a guy in a lot? No, just kidding. But his boss walks in. Hey, we have to finish the paperwork. But it's just amazing when we step out in faith and you see someone when they encounter Jesus, how their eyes are open to his love and promises. There's those moments when Jesus shows up. You see, the world is not looking for another religious conversation. They don't want to be invited to a sermon. They don't want to be invited to some box called a church. They want to know the real Jesus. It's in those moments that our eyes are opened up to God's love. And guess what? God is gracious enough to use imperfect vessels like us. People with bad attitudes and not great responses. Jesus wants to use us and invite us in that journey of showing his love and presence. One uh, commentary came across and said this this week. Typically, it is not the persuasive power of the empty tomb but a personal encounter with the risen Lord that leads us to faith. It was that way for Peter and Thomas and the other disciples, and it was that way for Paul, and it is still that way today. How many have encountered Jesus in their life in a significant way? You see, it's in those moments that the world's not looking for apologetics to try to convince them that God's real. They have to experience God. You see, there's that intellectual knowledge and there's that experiential knowledge and they are hungry for something that is real. So what we're going to look at today is two significant encounters that led to uh, an amazing faith journey that these disciples were on. Let's go to Luke 24, verse 1. It says this, But on the first day of the week at early dawn, they came to the tomb taking spices that they had prepared. Now often when we look at the resurrection story like we studied at Easter as we studied the crucifixion, we often kind of skip over this scene, but here's what we have to understand. The women that were coming to the tomb were not expecting it to be empty. They were coming to finish their ceremonial process of grieving. See, that Friday of Passover, when Jesus was crucified, they had to quickly rush before sundown to put him in this tomb. So they actually weren't able to finish the process that they started. So you can imagine that Sabbath day. These are those that loved Jesus, that spent time with him, that thought he was the one that was coming to save this people from Roman oppression as they grieved that Sabbath day, which would normally be a day of celebration following the Passover. This is when you have all your friends and family in town. You are part through the weekend, but they are there grieving, preparing burial spices because they cannot go to the tomb because it's the Sabbath and they would break the Sabbath law. So that early morning, they wake up, they muster the strength just to get this done. And as they're walking there, verse 2 says this, they found the stone rolled away from the tomb, but when they did not find the body, they were perplexed by this. Now the word perplexed is quite Interesting. It literally means to be confused in a state of mind or to be disturbed. And here's the beautiful thing. See, God could have showed up any way he wanted at the resurrection. Why he did this with an empty tomb, we do not know. But often God gets our attention and disturbs us in ways to awaken us out of our slumber. He will disturb us at times and show up in ways that we do not expect. But again, this testimony and this story is so contagious. We'll find out in a minute why it was so significant. And as they're there, they stare at this empty tomb. And there's two men in dazzling clothes that stood beside them. Now, these are not two men with rhinestone jackets from the 80s. They are not shining because they've been bedazzled. This literally means this is the same word that Luke uses earlier on to describe lightning. It says, as they were looking at them, the picture is, they are so bright, it's like staring at the sun. They don't know what moment they've entered into. They may be seeing the light because they've died. They don't know what they're about to encounter. Verse 5, the women were terrified. That word terrified literally means scared to death. It's the word phobos, which where we get the word phobia. This is not fear and reverence and awe like we talk about in the New Testament for the fear of the Lord. This is, they are scared to death. They think they're going to die in this moment. And they bowed their faces to the ground, but the men said to them, why do you look for the living among the dead? He is not here, but he is risen. Haunting phrase, they say to them. I think a phrase that's very relevant for us today, that word look means to look for, to seek after, to find something that you are desiring. You see, we all are wired with desire that only God can fulfill. We're all wired with the specific desire that only God can fulfill the life we're looking for. Ever since mankind entered into sin back at early creation, we've been broken from that relationship that only God can fulfill. And they say the sentence, why are you desiring what will bring you life amongst dead things? 
How many know that when you gave your life to Jesus, you often gave your life to him because you've been looking for life in places that never brought you life? We look for life in things like addictions. We look for life in things like sexual relationships that are unhealthy. We look for life to try to fill that place of brokenness that only God can fulfill. And then we find Jesus and we walk away from those things. But how many know that as you grow in your relationship with God and as you get stuck in the religious practices, we start to settle for less than what God has for us? We start to settle for convenience. We start to settle for comfort. We start to wane in our area of passion. And things we used to say no to, we are now saying yes to. Things that used to be those things that we would reject or resist, we start to settle for a lesser Christianity. See, Jesus never intended us to have less of the life that he promised for us. He never intended us to have just a little bit of his life or just to enjoy his presence on occasion on a Sunday. He wants his presence available to you and touched with him every day. He wants to fulfill those needs. I need Jesus every day when I wake up, not just once a week. I don't need my quick fix of Holy Spirit. I need God daily because how many know we're broken, messed up people? We're people that need a Jesus that will come and save us and rescue us and heal us. But they'll see the world knows that the culture will often settle because they don't like the struggle to find those things that are actually good. We often settle for those things for convenience because the struggle to actually find something that is good and valuable takes a lot of work. I don't know about you, but I grew up hating tomatoes. Anybody here hate tomatoes when they were young? I hated tomatoes. See, I would order a burger. I loved cheeseburgers when I was a kid, and you would get a cheeseburger. I would always say, no pickles, no onions, and please, no tomatoes. Sure enough, you get no pickles, no onions, but that tomato would be there making your hamburger bun soggy. I never understood why people would eat them. My mom and my grandmother and my uncle, they would all eat tomatoes like apples. You know those people that eat tomatoes like apples? Like, they're amazing. It's a fruit. I'm like, it doesn't taste like a fruit. Fruit is awesome. Tomatoes are not awesome. So I grew up with this mentality that I did not like tomatoes until the day came when we planted a garden. And then you finally tasted the tomato off the vine. And you're like, what have I been missing my entire life? And I found out this week, I was listening to a podcast, and I couldn't believe what I found. But in the 1950s, there was this massive labor shortage in California. So we were unable to pick the tomato harvest. And with the increasing demand of tomatoes in the, the globe at large, and particularly in the U.S., we weren't able to have the demand for the tomato harvest. So they invented these harvesting machines, but there was a problem. The machines would harvest the tomatoes, and they would squish the tomatoes. And they were losing about 50% of their crops from these machines. So as they're trying to have these tomatoes, the tomato harvest again is going down, and they're losing money in the industry, and they put the tomatoes on the conveyor belts, and they would roll off because they're round. So tomatoes were this problem in the fruit industry. So one scientist out of UC Davis gets this idea. He says, I wonder if I can make a different type of tomato that we can harvest easily. So he developed this tomato called the VF-145. It sounds like a jet engine of some kind. So he develops this tomato, and it was thicker skinned, and it was called the square tomato. He intentionally modified it. It was the first genetically modified food that we had. It was slightly square so it wouldn't roll off the conveyor belt. It was thick enough so that the machines could pick it, but there was a problem. It didn't taste good, but no one cared because they knew people would buy it because of the convenience. So an entire generation, i.e. my generation, grew up with terrible tomatoes. Because the difficulty of planting and harvesting the fresh fruit is a long process. We settle for less than what God's intended us for. Because good quality fruit takes work. It takes work in our relationship with God to produce fruit that is lasting, to produce fruit that is worth something. We have to cultivate that relationship with him. So if you're in that place where your relationship with God is falling stagnant or falling difficult, start to ask yourself, what things have I settled for? What things am I settling into that God's intended for so much more for me? Why do we seek living things amongst dead things? So as they're in the midst of this encounter with these angels, 
They go on and says this verse 6. Remember how we told you while he was still in Galilee that the Son of Man must be handed over to sinners and crucified and on the third day rise again. See, it's an important practice for us as believers to learn how to remember. We have to remember those moments when we encounter God. As you study memory, just actually memory in your brain, there are significant moments where we have long-term memory, and often long-term memories are created in moments of shock or wonder or amazement. They're created in times when you don't expect things. But how many know when the Holy Spirit speaks to you, it's often in the still, small voice, not a Mount Sinai encounter? We often hear the still, small voice of the Lord. So we have those moments where we encounter God, and often we experience what we call memory decay. Your memories start to fade, and the way your memory fades is through interference and disruption. When you often have something that tries to displace those memories, how many have ever been in a conversation before, and someone interrupts you and you forget what you're about to say? That's called interference. And see, the enemy knows how to interfere with what God's trying to speak in your life. He tries to displace those thoughts with negative lies. And one of the key ways we have to engage with what God's saying is we have to remember. We have to rehearse. We have to write down those things that the Holy Spirit is saying to us. So these angels say, remember those words. Recollect in your mind those words that he said to you. So as they're there, they start to go through this story and they run back. Verse 11 to tell the disciples but these words seemed to be an idle tale and they did not believe them so here we go these two women have this encounter with these angels they they go and tell them jesus is alive we didn't see him but the tomb is empty and they go back but this is unique the disciples refuse to believe them that word refuse literally means they rejected belief They don't believe or trust the testimony of these women because, unfortunately, in the first century, the testimony of a woman was considered not reliable. They were lesser than in society. So if you were in a court case and a woman came before you in trial with an accusation against you, you would need multiple witnesses because her testimony in court was not valid. So hear these men, hear this testimony of the women, and they think to themselves, it's not a valid testimony. We can't trust the words you speak. How many are grateful that God is ending that silence with women in the church in Jesus' name? That they're breaking that mold. See, the church was designed to liberate, not hold people in captivity. So as they're there, they're sharing this testimony. This is actually one of the great apologetic proofs of the resurrection. The fact that all the gospel writers wrote down that women were the first reporters of his resurrection in that day would have been embarrassing and made the documents illegitimate. If this was a myth or a story that people were telling, they would never write that this is how it came about. They would never write this. First century would not accept these documents. It's actually one of those proofs. But here we have these disciples that they reject the testimony. But I love Peter's response in verse 12. But Peter got up and ran to the tomb, stooping and looking in. He saw the linen cloths by themselves. Then he went home amazed at what had happened. How many know we can't let others determine our faith and passion for Jesus for us? We can't let others and their refusal or their reluctance to pursue Jesus prevent us from pursuing him with everything we have. We're called to run the race and not be weary, to push back those things that entangle us and keep us from pursuing what God has for us. And I love when you read the Gospel of John, John writes down, listen, I love it. He he has this testimony and this history where Peter was always the one that made it to the tomb first. John's Gospel then rewrites, but I too ran with him. And actually beat him to the tomb. I love that. John's like, I'm going to have the last word. Peter, I love you, brother. You're dead. I'm going to write down actually what happened, even though you had the great testimony for these many years before my gospel. See, we have to have people that are willing to pursue after Jesus alongside of us. And I can imagine Peter and John are sprinting to the tomb, and John's like, you ain't going to beat me, Peter. I'm a son of thunder. I'm one of those men that are going to make it to the tomb first. We have to have those people that help us continue the race that Jesus has called us to run. Those that, are again, won't distinguish our faith, but ignite faith within us. I remember several years ago, my brother wanted to run a marathon. I said, man, I don't know if I can run a marathon, but I'll run a half marathon with you. So we started to train for these half, this half marathon, and we'd run multiple miles a week. I, I got one of those really cool water bottle strap belts. 
I, looked, I was one of those guys on, on the trail, had my water bottle, and we would run, and we would train. And when it came to the actual half marathon day, I was ready. We were in Sacramento. It was the Cowtown Marathon. And I was there, and I was pumped, and I feel good, and it's crisp in the air, and the, the bell goes off, and I just go out sprinting. You know, again, my game plan was to pace myself, but you feel so good, and adrenaline's so high, I just go for it, and I'm beating people. But then you start to slow down. And the adrenaline starts to wear off, and people start to pass you. And you're like, am I going to make it today? And I hit mile five, and my wife is there cheering me on. And she says, oh, my gosh, what's wrong with you? I said, what? What? She said, you look like you're about to die. I was like, babe, I'm so tired. I was like, I promise I run farther than five miles when I train. I promise you. She's like, don't worry, babe. You can make it. It was like that Rocky Adrian moment that I needed. So I start running, and I'm trying to get some motivation. Mile six happens, and I'm just barely struggling. Now I'm getting that sense of, what if I do this walk-run thing? But then all of a sudden, this tribe of power-walking mothers in purple shirts pass me. And something incites and ignites within me. I say, I'm not going to lose to the power walking purple shirt moms. I am not going to lose. So they, then they become my pace horse. So I am running. I'm like, I'm going to pass power walkers. I pass power walkers. I make sure they don't catch up to me. I don't want to sear them in my rear view mirror. I am running. And then I come across fanny pack runner guy. And he's got it down. He's got these swizzle hips as he's running. <laughs> And I'm like, I'm not going to lose to that guy. But he was ahead, big time. And he became that one that I chased after. And I finished that race and beat the fanny pack, man. How many know you need those people to challenge you in your journey, to challenge you in the race that God has for you? And again, it's awkward, and we're all selfish people and self-centered. But Jesus is with us in the journey of making us more like him and less like us. But we need those people that challenge us in our pursuit of Jesus. So John Peter to the tomb. But this story continues. Now this empty tomb story starts to spread. Verse 13. Now on that same day, two of them were going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem, and talking with each other about the things that had happened. What are they talking about? They're not talking about just the crucifixion. They're now talking about this story that is spreading about this empty tomb. Now, we really don't know much about Emmaus. As we have archaeology studies and look, there's three possible locations outside of Jerusalem. Uh, in our early documents, it says it was about 60 stadia away from Jerusalem. We learned that a stadium is about 600 feet in the Roman time. So approximately seven miles, your Bibles may say something slightly different. And as they're walking to this place, Emmaus, this little known town, many believe that they did not live there. They just, however, were getting away because of the time of the crucifixion. Fiction. They were trying to avoid all the pain and sorrow of the moment. Here's what one scholar writes. He says, Emmaus is the place we go in order to escape. It's a bar, a movie. Wherever it is, we throw up our hands and say, it makes no difference anyway. Emmaus is whatever we do or wherever we go to make ourselves forget. It's that place we go to avoid the pain, the sorrow, the difficulty we're in. But there's hope on our road to Emmaus. Verse 15. While they were talking and discussing, Jesus himself came near and went with them. Jesus joins you on your journey. Jesus doesn't leave us, leave us alone in the process. And you may be in that place where you're bewildered and wondering what the next step is for your life. You're discouraged. You've lost your job. You are in the middle of a divorce. Jesus doesn't abandon you on the journey. He's with you on the journey. He's there to walk alongside of you and to comfort you and encourage you. But something unique happens as they're walking on this road. Verse 16, it says, but their eyes were kept from recognizing him. Something strange happens here. Where for some reason when he's there, he hides his appearance so they don't recognize that it's actually him. You see, we find this strange theology throughout the Old Testament, particularly in the Psalms, where God hides himself. He hides his face. And what he often does is he'll cloak his presence in our life. Even though he's with us, he wants us to seek him and find him in ways we never knew him before. He wants us to explore him. And what we know later on is he starts to open the scriptures to them. We'll study in a second. As he opens the scriptures to him, what happens is their hearts start to burn within them. 
See, it's in those seasons of seeking God that he ignites faith within us to transform and change us into the people he's called us to be. Because if he was just there with his presence and his light and his glory, we would never move from that place. We'd never actually fulfill the commission he's called for us. You see, oftentimes when we're in that place of discouragement, when we're on our road to Emmaus, we want Jesus to be the superhero and come and rescue us. How many are with us? You want Jesus to fly down with his cape and that big superhero savior S on his chest and to save you. I found this picture this week. This is the Jesus we often want. We want bodybuilding buff Jesus to break the cross right in front of us. But here's the beautiful thing. Jesus doesn't want to just be your superhero. He wants to be your shepherd. See, the dominant narrative throughout the Old Testament is that Jesus is a shepherd that walks alongside of us, that leads us beside still waters, and he wants you to hear his voice. See, he's not just looking for you to have a visitation. He wants you to know his voice. He says his sheep hear and know his voice. So what does he do? He walks alongside of them and starts to speak with them. Verse 17, and he said to them, why are you discussing these things and walking with each other, looking so sad. Verse 18. Then one of them whose name was Cleopas answered him, Are you the only stranger in Jerusalem who does not know the things that have taken place in these days? I love it. I love that Luke embarrasses his friend Cleopas. I love it. Because here's what we would know. We don't know exactly who Cleopas was. We may believe in John chapter 19 and 20, there's one witness named Mary that says the, hus- the, the wife of Clopas. So it's most likely the same name with a slight variant of spelling. But we believe that Cleopas was an early church leader at this time. He was one of the disciples. He was not one of the 12, but probably one of the 72. But here's why Luke writes this, other than embarrassing his friend. It brings authenticity so that most likely when the Luke's gospel was written, Cleopas was still alive and people could ask him about the account. They could go and ask him and say, hey, we, we know that story. You can just imagine Cleopas being in the house church and they're reading Luke. And he's like, here's the moment that I miss Jesus. I was the guy that didn't recognize Jesus and asked him, is he the only one that doesn't know what's going on? So here's Cleopas, and he says, you don't know what's happening. I love Jesus' response, verse 19. He asked them, what things? God knows exactly what's happening. Jesus knows exactly the answer to his question, but what God does is he often asks us questions to reveal the motive of our heart. He often asks us questions to reveal what we've actually started to believe or subscribe to in our heart. And it starts to rise to the surface. Verse 19b, the things about Jesus of Nazareth, who is a prophet, mighty in deed and word before God and all the people. And how the chiefs, priests, and leaders crucified him and condemned him to death. Here's that phrase. He was a prophet, mighty in deed and word. Acts 7, Stephen uses the same phrase to describe Moses. You see, this was the reputation of Moses, that he was a great prophet, he was a great deliverer, mighty indeed, but there was a problem. Moses was not able to lead them into the promised land. Moses was a fallible human just like us. See, Jesus wants to know and reveals that he's more than a prophet in their life. He wants to reveal that he's Savior. He wants to reveal that he's the shepherd in their life. He wants to reveal that he's the one that can truly set them free and bring them a life that no one else can offer. He reveals that he's more than just a prophet in their life. That comes to the surface. Verse 21. But we had hoped that he was the one to redeem us from Israel. Yes, besides this, it is now the third day since this thing has taken place. As I studied this word, Hope. A lot of different people would comment on this. They would say they have a frustrated hope. They have a bruised hope. They have a shattered hope. You see, hope is that confidence and trust you have in a person or a future event about to take place. You see, what God's about to do in this moment is going to transform their temporal hope of a kingdom that would come and overtake the Roman army to an eternal hope that will not be shaken. 1 Corinthians 13 says these three things remain, faith, hope, and love. He wants to take your hope from being temporal and menial things that we have to be an eternal hope that is lasting, that no matter what's happening in your life, you will not be shaken. We are not those that shrink back but push forward to the hope that God has for us, it writes in Hebrews. So as he's there, he reveals the state and condition of their hope. Verse 22, I continue on with the testimony of what the women had said. 
Verse 25, then he said to them, oh, how foolish you are and how slow of heart you are to believe all that the prophets have declared. I love how Jesus does this. The message says this, so thick-headed and slow-hearted. How many thick-headed people out there? And slow-hearted people. Here's what I love. Jesus says this in an endearing way because he loves these disciples. These are people he's spent time with, but he doesn't leave them on their thick-headed, slow-hearted journey. He's still with them. And what does he do? It says he takes all these scriptures in verse uh, 26 and 27. Was it not necessary that the Messiah should suffer these things and enter his glory? Beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted them the things about himself in scripture. This is one epic Jesus Bible study that's taking place. Can you imagine sitting there and him opening things up? And he starts to reveal about the sin narrative and how there was a promised Messiah that would come and how there was going greater than Moses that would follow. And he's walking through the three major portions of the Old Testament. We have uh, what we call the Torah, which is those first five books of the Bible. We then have the prophets, which is kind of the historical section. And then we have the writings, which is the Psalms and the Proverbs and the book of Job. So he starts to reveal all these amazing revelations about this king that's going to come. And Isaiah 4. 49, he's going to be a suffering servant that will undertake the sins of those that have broken the law of God. And this is this moment where they start to see and it unravels the goodness of God in the midst of their journey. This is why God often hides himself in the midst of our journey on the road to Emmaus. He hides himself. He cloaks his presence so that we're awakened to know the wonder of his word. Verse 28, as they came near the village in which they were going, he walked ahead as if he were going on. I love it. Jesus just continues on the path. Verse 29, but they urged him strongly saying, stay with us because it's almost evening and the day is now nearly over. So he went and stayed with him. Now the customs at that time are very unique where normally if they would invite someone in to stay with them, they would have to ask six, seven, or eight times before they would actually enter in. So there's this discussion taking place because in that culture, when you would stay in someone's home or their residence, you were coming underneath their authority. They were the ones that were there to help you and take care of you. So this is a big conversation that happened with Jesus. So Jesus enters this house, and I just am reminded of Revelation chapter 3. See, Jesus is available for all those that open the door to him. What does he say? I stand at the door and knock. Open your door to me, and I will come and sit with you and dine with you. This is that picture where they open the door. He's there with them. Verse 30, when he was at the table with them, he took bread, blessed it, and broke it, and gave it to them. Now, this is a very unusual practice in that culture at that time. Normally, the head of the house would do this. Jesus sits down, takes the bread, and he becomes the host of the meal. So as he's there, they're like, uh, this is not normal. This is not cultural in any way. But as he starts to take the bread, they remember the time he multiplied the loaves. They remember the time when he fed the 5,000. They remember the testimony that the disciples had shared at the Passover meal, how he took the bread and broke it. As he breaks the bread, it says this in verse 31, their eyes were opened and they recognized him. See, Jesus' glory is often revealed in our breaking. Jesus' glory is often revealed in our breaking. He's after broken vessels that are contrite in spirit. In that place of the breaking of bread, they were reminded of the goodness of Jesus, and their eyes are open to recognize him. They van he vanishes from their sight. They said, did not our hearts burn within us as he opened the scriptures to us? He wants your heart to be burning for him again. You may be on your road to Emmaus right now. You may be in that place like those women that are going to the tomb and you are discouraged and you've been in that place where you are in a place of mourning. Jesus wants to meet you in that place of open and brokenness. He wants to meet you on that road to Emmaus. He wants to meet you in that journey where you're in the pursuit after him, but you feel like you're by yourself because Jesus is with you in the midst of your breaking. He wants to reveal his presence in the midst of your breaking. So today we have an amazing story, an amazing testimony uh, of my friend here who had some brokenness in his life that God did an amazing miracle through. So would you welcome my friend Tyler, Frederick, and his wife Megan as uh, they share this morning. Hi, I'm Tyler Frederick, and this is a part of my testimony and how the Lord set me free. I grew up in San Jose, California with my mom and older brother. My parents got divorced when I was two, so I, only saw that, so I only saw my dad once or twice a month on the weekends. 
The male role model in my life quickly became my older brother. My mom worked a lot and wasn't around, so we had little to no supervision growing up. <clears throat> by age eight, I was molested by a family member. <clears throat> At age 10, I began looking at pornography and also watching it a lot at friends' houses. This led to me using a video camera and recording my mom's friend getting in and out of the shower. Then I would watch it, then I watched it over and over. My brother also started his path of drugs and drinking. Around 13, I remember my brother breaking my mom's nose. As she locked herself in the bathroom, crying and bleeding, I grabbed a kitchen knife and threatened to kill him if he came any closer. This was the first of many times watching my older brother, who I looked up to, get carried away in handcuffs after the police arrived. <clears throat> After serving some time, my brother got released on house arrest and came back home. This was when my brother introduced weed into my life, which also became cigarettes and drinking. Stealing and lying became my norm to support my habits. I used to break into lockers at school and take jewelry, money, and clothes to trade for drugs. Doing drugs paired with my rough home life ruined my attendance. And after going to four different high schools, I quit and got my GED. I then moved out of my mom's house to live with my dad, who eventually moved to Sacramento. He was engaged at the time, and she had a son around my age. This was when I was introduced to methamphetamines. Her son and I smoked meth every day. <clears throat> it turned into a five-year battle. My weight went from 170 pounds down to 140 pounds. I would stay awake for two days at a time and begin seeing demons. I constantly thought of suicide. Thinking I could escape this drug, I moved to Sacramento with my dad and got a job doing insulation. I later found out the owner was addicted to meth and I began smoking with him. This turned into months of free meth. I didn't know why he was so generous, though. My last shift there, I was so high at his house that he took advantage of me and sexually assaulted me. This traumatic event led, to continue, led me to continue my addiction for yet another year. My life was so low, I would try anything to quit. I began calling out to a God I didn't know. God heard, heard my cries, and I was completely healed of this drug overnight. <clears throat> <clears throat> <clears throat> Meaning, I woke up, I never smoked meth again, no withdrawals or rehab centers needed. God just took it. Even after this miracle, I still didn't pursue God. Less than a year later, I was set free from my addictions to weed and cigarettes and pornography. In 2008, I met my amazing wife. <clears throat> I met my amazing wife, and we began attending the rock where I was baptized and gave my life to the Lord. In, in 2010, I had my appendix removed and was prescribed Norco and Vicodin. This started my addiction to pills. Lying to my wife became normal, spending a lot of our money to buy pills. I was constantly filled with anger. 
After five to six years of battling these drugs, I decided I couldn't continue this path, so I stopped cold turkey. I was admitted into the ER. For three to four days, I was very sick, detoxing from the pills. I began seeking for truth over my life and healing, and again, he showed up. With a lot of praying and God's help, I finally found freedom. <clears throat> No more drugs, a beautiful wife, four amazing kids, and a church family that accepts me. I know, I know there are some of you that have similar life stories, but guess what? This freedom isn't just for me. Thank you. Thank you.